A horrible crime has been committed at Glandier Manor, near Montlhéry, a small French town. Last night, someone tried to murder Miss Matilda Strangerson, the daughter of the famous scientist. More on page 12. Although the castle is currently guarded by several police officers, we succeeded in establishing an accurate succession of the facts thanks to the precious testimony of Father Jacques, the faithful servant of the Strangerson family. The twelve strokes of midnight sound. Matilda decides to go to bed and enters her room. She closes her door and locks it twice. Half an hour later, Mr. Strangerson and Father Jacques hear terrified screams coming from Matilda's room. She yells, Help! Murder! Gunshots can then be heard and the sound of overturned furniture, as in a fight. Matilda then yells, Help! Help! Dad! Father Jacques tries to break down the door, but it won't open. Father Jacques then gets an idea and runs outside to check the window, but the window is closed and the bars in front of it haven't been touched. He then runs into Mr. and Mrs. Bernier, the caretakers, who live in the house next to the pavilion and who went to look where the noise came from. Mr. Bernier, a strong man, succeeds in breaking down the door. Finally it opens and they hurry into the room. Matilda is lying on the floor unconscious, she's covered in blood with a deep wound at her head and has strangulation marks on her neck. On the floor lies a bloody mutton bone and a gun that Father Jacques recognizes with shock as his. On the wall is a bloody handprint and two bullet marks. Nobody under the bed, nobody behind the door, nobody anywhere. Nothing but signs. The judge marker is way to the matter this morning. Oh dang it, it's always the same, did it again. Marquet is with Q-U, not C-K. Can't they spell my name right for once? Ah. I'm Joseph Rouletabille, a little reporter from the French newspaper, L'Epoque, and I'm also on my way to the manor. And this is my friend and colleague, Jean Sinclair. Nice to meet you. I'm Judge Marquet, and this is my clerk, Georges Madeleine. You'll understand, of course, that we, as part of the investigating team, can't tell you anything about the case, Mr. Rouletabille. And trust me, you won't be able to get into the manor they don't accept any journalists. Oh, we'll find a way. Trust me. Oh no, no, not again. Marquet is with Q U, not C K. Sorry about that, Mr. Marquet. Shall I drive you to the manor? Oh well. It's the strangest in manner, the cars I'm spotting over there. Because in that case, my clerk and I would rather explore the woods and take a stroll to breathe some fresh, unpolluted air. <sighs> All right, Mr. Marquette. Shall I take the car back home, then? Oh, we'll take it. You can drive us. You're that reporter, aren't you? Aren't you, Monsieur Darzac? I'm sorry, but we don't allow any interviewers on the grounds. Now listen to this. The Presbytery has lost nothing of its charm, nor the garden of its brightness. Uh, uh, sir? How do you know? I'll tell you, but shouldn't this say between you and me? The car works thanks to solar energy. It's one of the professor's greatest inventions. Well, what's happened? A breakdown? A cloud. We'll have to wait for the sun. Well, I'll take this opportunity to go pee. Wait for me! Ugh. 
I will ask you not to talk too loud in the park. My father is resting in a room and the windows are open. And so is the professor. In the same room? Of course, not in his own room. Oh, good lord, what a stupid idea of you to walk the entire way. Me? Let's not wait. We're gonna eat. We shall have to eat some red meat. Bloody meat. Bloody meat. That's what we're going to eat. In the Lord's name, what's your problem? Have you all gone mad or what? Listen, Robert. I'm really, really sorry about Matilda. I'm completely in shock myself. I garden a miss and I work a skin. I watch out for the professor's business. Why did Mathilda sleep in the pavilion, and not in the manner as usual? She wanted to have some fresh air. It's a lot cooler than in the castle here. So that's the one. Behind this door happened something none of us can yet explain. <gasps> the perfume of the air. These bars are unbreakable and have not been broken. Look at that hand. That hand must be the one from the killer. It was dark in the room. He probably thought he was holding the door and tried to push it. What a funny hand. Look at that hand. There are not many hands like that. It's exceptionally ordinary. This hand, which looks so strange, is simply a deformed shadow of it. The killer touched the wall and by sliding it to get rid of the blood, he made a weird hand-shaped blood print on it. The detective, Frederick Larson, is persuaded of the fact that the murderer got out by the most natural way, which happens to be the door. Well, well. Since when does a famous reporter like Rutaby know Mr. Darzac? And since when is the famous detective Frédéric Larsan here? Since the discovery of the crime, my dear Rutaby. You see this. There are steps going to the manor. And there are steps leaving the manor. These are the steps I've been waiting for. These are the murderer steps. The murderer? But what about these big ones? They're also the murderer's footsteps. Are there two of them? No, there's only one murderer, and there are no accomplices. Excellent! Excellent. The killer simply took his shoes off to fool the police, and he went back barefoot. Excellent, Mr. Ruthadi. You'd make a wonderful detective. If you had more methods, that is. <laughs> Be careful. Logic is not everything. I'll defeat him. I'll defeat Big Freddy. I'll defeat him all. Ugh. He's no cleverer than me. I'm going to win this case. Mark my words, St. Clair. I'm going to win it. St. Clair? Who lives in there? The caretakers, the Berniers. I'll wait for you here. They dislike me quite a bit since I told the police it was impossible for them to hear the gunshots on the pavilion, get dressed, leave their cottage, and run to the pavilion in less than a minute. You can trust us. We're not from the police. I don't trust any of you! I know, but I also know that you're gonna eat bloody meat. Oh my goodness! What in God's name is this supposed to mean? We're gonna eat bloody meat? Poaching. They were looking for strangers and chickens. That's where they were already dressed. They were already outside. But what about the bloody meat? 
heard Father Jacques singing in the garden. He was singing about the caretakers. They are suspects for the time being, and so no more poaching. And so, no more food. So, they're gonna eat raw meat. Red meat. Oh no! Not him! Who's that? The Green Man. Professor Strangerson's gamekeeper. No, there is no more wine. <clears throat> what are you looking at? You're watching my wife's tits, aren't you, bastard? What are you waiting for? Go to the kitchen where you belong! <laughs> what do you think you're doing? <laughs> is there something you want to tell me? What's wrong with you? Come on, tell me! Tell me! <laughs> <laughs> Now go repair those fucking ears! Hurry up! Hurry up, I said! <laughs> what are you looking at? It's not your business! You were there. You in park for crime. Oh, shut the fuck up, you cunt chaser! <laughs> Get out of my house! I don't know who you two think you are, but it might be good to know that he's the murderer! I'm telling you! He's playing the great hunk right there, but this guy's got banned from his Indian tribe because he's fucked the chief's wife. Yeah, what about what about that? The professor being nice enough to give him a job because otherwise he'd still be eating rats in the wood. A man was in my room. He sprang at me and tried to strangle me. I was nearly stifled when suddenly I was able to reach the drawer of my night table and grasp a revolver which I had placed in it. At that moment the man had forced me to the foot of my bed and brandished in over my head a sort of mace. But I had fired. He immediately struck a terrible blow at my head. All that, Monsieur, passed more rapidly than I can tell it, and I know nothing more. Nothing? Have you no idea as to how the assassin could escape from your chamber? Ah, Mr. Darzen. Robbie! Was the man you saw tall or short? Little or big? I only saw a shadow, which appeared to me formidable. You cannot give us any other indication? I know nothing more, Monsieur, that a man threw himself upon me and that he fired at me. I fired at him. Please don't ask. I know nothing more. I have observed this yellow room and examined it from left to right and top to bottom. I think that you and I all agree that there is no possible way of leaving the room than the door. It is by the door then that the murderer made his way out. He committed the crime and he got out by the door. At what time? At what time? At the moment it was most easy for him to do so. At the moment, most explainable. So completely explainable that there can be no other possible explanation. So let us go over the moments that followed the crime. There is the first moment. The moment when Professor Strangerson and Father Jacques stood in front of the door, ready to block the murderer's way. There is the second moment when Father Jacques went outside, leaving Professor Strangerson alone in front of the door. There is the third moment, when the professor is joined by the caretaker Bernier. There is the fourth moment, when the professor, the Berniers, and Father Jacques stand in front of the door. And there is the fifth moment! when Bernier and Father Jacques break down the door and enter the yellow room. The most evident way of escaping is, of course, when there are fewest people in front of the door. The moment when there's only one person in front of the door. The moment when there's only Mr. Strangerson in front of the door. The door of the yellow room, therefore, has only been opened to Mr. Strangerson, and the murderer got out.
We must admit that Mr. Strangerson had several reasons not to block the assassin. His daughter, bleeding on the floor, and a possibly armed killer. Mathilda, did she have the courage and power to ask her father to close the door behind her and to leave her for another minute to avoid a scandal? We don't know who the killer is, but there is no doubt that they do. What a terrible secret to keep. What a terrible thing it must have been to fulfill your dying daughter's wish and lock her up in her room in which you knew she might have died. First, I swear to God that I never left the door. Second, that door always stayed closed when I was alone. Third, where was I? Yes, the, when we entered the room, my my servants and I, the, the, the killer wasn't there. And third point, I don't know who the murderer is. That was your fourth point, but oh well. Ladies and gentlemen, the meeting is over. I believe you, monsieur. Why do you believe the professor? You still didn't explain that one sentence to me. The thing you said to Robert Darzak that changed his mind? Presbytery... charm? Ah, that. Well, that's a long story. Professor Strangerson and his daughter were invited at some party of some rich governor. I was also there, for work. And while sitting at a table, drinking some glass of wine, I smelled a remarkable perfume. The perfume of the Lady in Black. It so happens that it was Mephilda's perfume. Everybody stepped away to let these two through, and they all whispered, That's the Professor Stranger suit. And there you've got the eternal fiancé, Robert Darcy, which made a few guests chuckle. She was carrying a letter. Later that evening, Robert took her away from the crowd. I eased off their conversation, and there I learned the most interesting news. The Presbytery has lost nothing of its charm, nor the garden its brightness. Must I commit a crime then to win you? <gasps> and they left. And so had my evening with this Oh, that's Arthur Brantz. Apparently he comes by this evening and drops some stuff and tomorrow he's gone. Aha! And so that's what you told him about in the car. Yes. I repeat his own sentence to him. Must I commit a crime then to win you? There's something between Darzak and Mathilda Svenjusson. There's someone who is opposed to their marriage. Someone who attempts the killer before she marries him. In the car, Robert Darzak was scared, frightened, and he told me, Monsieur, I'm going to ask you something that might seem insane, but for which I'd give my life. You should never, never pronounce that sentence in front of the judges. Not even talk about that evening. Forget about it. I swear to you that I'm innocent. I swear that I will help to you to find the murderer by any possible way. I'll allow you to stay at the manor as if you were the owner. But forget, forget that evening. I must unfortunately leave the manor tonight, but please, please make sure that nobody, and I tell you nobody, can enter Matilda's bedroom this evening. Make the arrival of the murderer impossible. Do not sleep, do not rest. The murderer is coming back. Tonight! Tonight? But what makes you say that? We must get weapons. Guns. We must warn Larson, the judge, the police, the... And one of the Air Force, after all. No, Sinclair. We're doing this alone. We must protect Mephilda and Robert's secret. I know where we'll find these guns. Come with me! Oh! Uh, we are looking for uh, weapons. Guns. To kill who? Oh, no, no, no. Not to kill, just to hurt, or worse, but only if 
necessary? I don't shoot to hurt or scare. I shoot to kill. Ah, uh, we are waiting uh, for a, a murderer. Okay. I can't understand anything. At least we'll be able to see. One, two, three. three. Oh, oh, ah. Where are you going? Oh, oh. Oh, God, you're hopeless. Okay, I'll try again. One, two, three. Please don't I think the Starzak is of a perfect hypocrisy. Time. I think, on the contrary, that this little scene Robbie, argues Robbie, in his favor. Do? Darzak is leaving. There comes her father. What's she doing? Shh! She's pouring something. She wants her father to sleep. The arrival of the mother that Darzak fears. She's preparing it. Indeed. Joseph! <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Sinclair. I'm hungry. Oh, well, would you two like to accompany me to dinner then? But... Aren't you watching Mathilda's room? Uh, not to worry, Mrs. Sinclair. Four of my men are watching the park from a distance. The professor doesn't like having too many policemen around the manor. Two other officers are following Darzak on his mysterious trip. And as for me, I'll be keeping an eye on the first floor itself. Blast! My cane! Your cane? Yes, my cane. I must have left it up in that tree. Uh, why don't you two gentlemen head inside while I retrieve it? I'll meet you inside momentarily. Cane? What cane? Where did he get it? Frédéric Larsan arrived at the Glandier Manor before me. Here he began his inquiry before me. He has had time to find out things about which I know nothing. Where did he find that cane? It is probable that his suspicion, no more than that, his reasoning, has led him to lay his hand on something tangible. I bet that cane belongs to Robert Darzac. To Frédéric Larsan, this cane must bring them piece of very damaging evidence. But in what way? You still think Darzac is innocent? There are loads of coincidences. His schedule on the night of the crime that he refused to tell us about. The cane, the mysterious conversation in her room this evening, and the fact that he's gone tonight. Coincidences are the worst enemy of truth. Larson might be right after all, then. We need to find you somewhere to hide to watch Mathilda's room. Oh, no, no, no. No way. Perfect. Okay, come out. It's time for our appointment with Larson. Oh no, no wine for me, please. Cheers. Mm. Hmm. Excellent. Not really. Far too young for my taste, but oh well. Miss Arutabi, I believe we both have our own conclusion tonight. Then we at least agree on one thing. You have a guilty? What about you? Oh yes, I do. I might have one. Could it be the same one? It might be. Although, if you haven't changed your mind, I don't think so. Robert Azak is an honest man. You still think so? I do. Well, I think he's not. So, it'll be the battle, then? It'll be the battle. And I'll add with you, Frédéric Larson, and in a striking way! <laughs> well, Miss Arutabi, I've already told you to watch out. Your logic is good, but if you use it in the wrong way, it might work against you. Jackson? Freddy! He's sleeping! Holy biscuits! Mathilda is poisoning everybody! It's the food she wants us to sleep! Now remember, if you see anything, anything at all, Warn me by making the clock chime a few times. To do so, just move the hands of the clock, and you'll see me appear. Sacre! 
Good luck, mate. Joseph, Joseph. Oh goodness, I know it's wine. I didn't drink any. Joseph, wake up. Wake up, Joseph. Joseph, wake up. What was that for? Joseph, thank God. I was trapped in the clock. I crawled to your room and found you unconscious. You scared me for a moment. Joseph, the rooster has cried. Oh, and somebody just penetrated me through this room. You're telling me this now? Why aren't we given the alarm? The killer might slip away. You, you stay here, and I'm going outside. <laughs> Ah! In the ah. name of God, ah. I caught you, you filthy! Goodness, it's me! Oh, goodness, that hurts! Oh, sorry. I thought you were the assassin! I bet you did. We need help over here. The kid is in my father's room. Ow! What? Still get the gamekeeper and shut up! Yes, yes, I'm going. The green man is not home. <gasps> ah! Put me down. And by all means, shut up. The killer's in there. No, don't. No, please. I beg you, don't. <coughs> please. Him a naught. We are going to block him. Oh. Oh. What? What? You were drugged. You fell asleep. The kid is in my father's room. What? Did you see his face? No, he was wearing a mask. Okay, listen, Freddy. Sacle is at the other bit of the corridor. Father Jacques is watching the staircases. And you must stay here. And I'm going to enter my father's room by outside. He'll try to escape, and you three will be there to block him. Alright? I see. Be careful. But do you have a gun? Yes, yes, I do. Do you know how to use it? He's coming! There! Where is he? I saw him, where is he? I felt his breath on me face. I touched him. This one's empty. There's nothing here. What are you doing? Father Jacques, help me please. She needs to go back to bed. Mm. Uh, uh. 
You who know the secret, tell us, and we might save you. Drink this, dear. It'll do you some good. There! He's there! Stop or I'll kill you! What's happening? What's happening? Where is he? Hold your fire, I'm coming. He's dead. He's dead, we shot him. Joseph, he's dead. He's dead. He died, we shot him and he's dead. Suckley, I got it. Father Jack, you may take off the mask. The gamekeeper? Impossible! This can't be. Wait a minute. I knew it! There is no bullet! This man, who you all believe a shot by a gun, died of a stab in the heart! What's this supposed to mean? Get up! You can't sit there! Get up! You are going to explain this to me. Fucking right now! Impossible! You did it with him, did you? Didn't you? Impossible! Did you? you disgusting No, no, no. Ah, duh. What are you doing here? Where's Joseph? I was going to ask you the same thing. How's Miss Strangerson? The doctor says she's been stabbed in her stomach. She's alive for bed. Oh, there you are. It's too late. I'm coming too late. This police officer told us, Monsieur Robert Azac, that he saw you getting off a train last night in Montfleury. What were you doing? I just one mile away from the place where that night, Mathilda Strangerson was victim of a second murder attempt. Monsieur Darzac, would you give us your time schedule of that night? Oh, you better think well, sir, because if you continue with your strange denial, I'll have to hold you at the court's disposition. I refuse. Robert Darzac, I arrest you in the name of the law. Put your hands behind your back. Stop! You're wrong, Marquet! You must defend yourself, sir! I won't, sir. <laughs> then I will, sir. Trust me, because I know the two halves of the assassin. I found you the house, sir. Tonight! I'll tell everybody tonight! You'll be free! Tonight! You all know who the assassin is tonight! I beg your pardon. Monsieur Rouletabille, I'll teach you what comes to making a farce of justice. By virtue of my discretionary power, I hold you at the court's disposition. I ask nothing better, Monsieur Marquet. I have come here for that purpose. I know who the murderer is. Well, tell us then! Who's the murderer? I will only tell you at ten past five, which leaves us with at least three hours of waiting before us. This look has gone far enough! We have a reconstruction to reconstruct! I swear, Monsieur Marquet, that when I'll tell you everything about the assassin, you'll understand why I couldn't say his name before. In the meantime, I can still give you some information about the death of the gamekeeper, the green man. Judge Marquet, I think it'd be extremely interesting to listen to what Joseph Rutabi has to say. Even more interesting, as he doesn't share my opinion. Fine then! Monsieur Rutabi, would you please tell us how the murderer got away? Well, Mrs. Bernier has admitted to us that she loved the gamekeeper and- Oh! Ah! 
Shut it, Banny! Or we'll lock you up in the greenhouse. Ah, oh, it's annoying in the end. Mrs. Bernier, to allow her lover to come and visit her, used her old rooster. Once his loud cry could be heard, the gamekeeper would leave his cottage and join Mrs. Bernier for a late night meeting. Right. Ah! Bernier, you shut your pie hole. Ah yes, it's getting irritating. But that night, Mrs. Bernier must watch over Mathilde and therefore sleeps in the manor next to her mistress's room. Of course, no possible meetings that night, but the rooster, Pretty ill these days. Cuffs and shouts as the gamekeeper, listening only to his own desire, grabs the ladder, runs to the castle, and enters her room by the window. Huh? Oh no, not now. I. Mm. You have to call me. I heard a chicken. Come now. Let's do it. <clears throat> No, no, I swear. This isn't the right- <sighs> Oh, my. Fine, then. They have quite some fun in the room. Now, after all, we better skip this part. So we're having this emotional moment with each other, they are disturbed by a noise. <gasps> Saint Clair's clock had fallen over. You need to go. Quickly. Not now. The gamekeeper I must leave, but me. he notices that someone moved his ladder. It was me who used it to watch <gasps> my father's room. Now? Leave, quickly. You have to leave by the corridor. Here, take your clothes. I see you tomorrow. Don't. Mm. Yes. He then hides into an old cupboard. When a few minutes later, everybody tries to help Mafilda, who got out of her room, the gamekeeper tries to escape. Saint Clair Stop notices him you. and tries to shoot him. Outside, at the corner, a shadow jumps on him and stabs him. And what was Mrs. Bernier doing in that time? Well, I... I ran to Miss Mathilda's room and- You bitch! Ah! Bernie! In the greenhouse! Go! Take him away! Now, Mr. Old Debbie, who did kill the gamekeeper? Dutch Marquet, you can ask me all day long, but I won't please. tell you before ten past five! Fine! Fine! Then I propose we're all going for a stroll and we'll come back here at five o'clock. I will not ask you to take the oath, because you have not been regularly summoned, but I trust there is no need to urge upon you the gravity of the statement you are about to make. I had explained how it was impossible for the murderer to get away without being seen, and yet he was there with us, in the courtyard. And you did not see him? No, all of us saw him, Monsieur Marquet. Speak out, sir, speak out. Tell us the murderer's name. You will find it on the list of the names present in the court on the night of the tragedy. Well, the list includes the dead keeper. Is he the killer? No, sir. Father Jacques? No, sir. The caretaker? No, sir. His wife? <laughs> no, sir. Uh, Mrs. St. Clair? <laughs> no. Then you. It's you. There's only you left. You are the murderer. Bravo. Wonderful. But completely absurd. No, sir. Then I do not understand what you're driving at. There was no other person at the end of the court. Yes, monsieur, there was. Not at the end of the court. Not under the court. But above the court. Someone who was leaning out of his window. Above the court! Frédéric Larson. Frédéric Larson. Frédéric Larson! It's impossible. He's mad. You dare to accuse Frédéric Larson? If you're not mad, what are your proofs? Proofs, monsieur? Do you want proofs? Well, here's one. Let Frédéric Larson be called. Usher, fetch Frédéric Larson. Monsieur Marquet, Frédéric Larson is not here. He left about four o'clock and has not been seen since. That is my proof. What proof? My absolute proof. Don't you see, this is the flight of Frédéric Larson. 
But why did you not accuse him when he was present? He would not have answered you! He could not give a better answer than the one he's given by his flight. He won't answer me. He'll never answer me. He will not come back. You will see no more of Frédéric Larson. I cannot believe that Larson has fled. There was no reason for his doing so. He didn't know he was gonna get this charge. Yes, he did. I told him. What? Do you mean to say that knowing Larson was the murderer, you gave him the opportunity to escape? Yes, monsieur, I did. I'm not a policeman. I am a journalist, and my business is not to arrest people. My business is in the service of truth, and is none other than executioner. You can now understand why you're afraid until this hour to divulge your name. I gave Larson time to catch the 417 train for Paris, where we would know where to hide and leave no traces. You will not find Frédéric Larson. He's too cunning. He's a man who's always escaped to, and whom you've long searched for in vain. If he did not succeed in outwitting me, he can easily outwit any police. This man, who four years ago introduced himself as Frédéric Larson, is notorious under another name. A name well known to crime. Frédéric Larson, Monsieur Marquet, is Balmier! Oh. Oh. Balmier, the famous crook! Balmier? Balmier was the best specimen of the high class gentleman swindler. He had been caught, but escaped on the very morning of his trial by throwing pepper into the eyes of the guards who were conducting him to court. It was known later that, in spite of the keen earned half to him, he had said that same evening at a first performance in the National French Theatre, without the slightest disguise. He then left France for America. He would need a volume to recount the event of this mastermind criminal. But why? Why and how did Larson kill the Indian gamekeeper? <laughs> the gamekeeper, hidden in the cupboard, saw what he should not have seen. Larson, the killer. To leave the castle without getting recognized, he put up the mask that Larson had hidden in that same cupboard, and he tries to escape, but he needs to be silenced. There, Larson kills with this. Whoa. What's happening? What's happening? Where is he? Hold your fire, I'm coming. This is child's play for an acrobat like Balmier. Furthermore, he wasn't asleep at all that night as he wanted to make us believe. We had dined with him, Monsieur Marquet. And at the end, he plays us a trick of his own invention, a sleep as brutal as conducive. He then disguised himself and waited to visit Mathilda's room. Unfortunately, he didn't know that my good friend Saint Clair was separately hidden in the clock at the end of the corridor. Follow me, please. How did you come to suspect Lars? My pure reason pointed to him. I satisfied myself that the murderer could not have left the gallery, either naturally or supernaturally. I narrowed the field of consideration to that small circle, so to speak. The murderer could not be outside that circle. So he's inside. Exactly. Now who was in it? There was, first, the murderer. Then there were Father Jacques, Saint Clair, Frédéric Larson, and myself. Now let's form a little circle, please. Since it had been demonstrated to me that the murderer could not have escaped, it was evident that the one of the four present in the gallery must be a double. He must be himself and the murderer also. I had seen, at one and the same time, Saint Clair and the murderer, Father Jacques and the murderer, myself and the murderer. But had I seen Frédéric Larson and the murderer at the same time? No! No! Two seconds had passed, during which I lost sight of the murderer. There! He arrived two seconds before us at the meeting point of the oh. Where is he? Oh. I saw him! Where is he? Larson throws the mask into the cupboard and notices a moving shadow. The gamekeeper. He pretends a few seconds later to look into that same cupboard and warns the gamekeeper to keep his mouth shut. This one's empty. As we are chasing the gamekeeper outside, Larson jumps out of the window and kills him! But there are facts that go against this theory. You saw Larson in Mathilda's room, so you go warn him in his own room, and there he was. He had just woken up. He probably saw me when I was looking for the window on my ladder. At that time, 
I did not suspect Larsan and thought him to be in his room on the other side of the gallery. And when I came to wake him, he naturally came out of his room. But this evidence puzzled me altogether. I could not explain how and why he had taken advantage of the moment when I had gone to the left wing of the chateau to find Saint-Clair and Father Jacques to return to my father's room. It was there a very dangerous thing to do. He risked being captured, and he knew it, and he very nearly was. But what then? What was the urgent reason which had compelled Larsan to go back to the room a second time? I guessed it to be some evidence of his presence there. He had left something very important in the room. He had forgotten his cane, quite simply. Cain, that could betray him. But why did he try to kill my father's stranger in the first place? Because he loved her, sir. He was madly in love. And because of that, and other things, he was capable of committing any crime. And did she know this? Yes, she did. But she was ignoring the fact that the man who tried to kill her was also Frédéric Larsan. Otherwise, of course, he would never have been accepted at the manor. But why didn't she recognize him? She never had the chance to, sir. Every time she saw him, he was either wearing a mask or in a room there were always so many people, and Larsan always made sure to keep his back turned in her presence. Monsieur Darzac, did my fellow stranger in any way confide to you on this matter? How is it that she has never spoken about it to anyone? If you are innocent, she would have wished to spare you the pain of being accused. That brings us to the explanation of the mystery of the Yellow Room. It seems to me that the mystery of the Yellow Room, Monsieur Rontabi, is wholly explained by your hypothesis. Frédéric Larsan is the explanation. We have merely to substitute him for Monsieur Robert Arzac. Evidently the door of the yellow room was open at the time Mr. Strangerson was alone, and that he allowed the man who was coming out of his daughter's room to pass without arresting him, perhaps at her entreaty to avoid all scandal. That does not follow, sir. There was no need for him to escape if he was not there. Not there? Evidently not. He could not have been there if he were not found there. But the evidence is of his presence. I swear that the killer was not there. Why do we conclude that he was? Because he left his tracks in the room. But may he not have been there before the room was locked? No, he must have been there before. Mademoiselle Strangerson could not have been her own murderer since the evidences pointed to somebody else. The assassin, then, had come before. If that were so, how was it Mathilda Strangerson had been attacked after? Or rather, that she had appeared to have been attacked after? There were marks of strangulation and the wound from a hard blow in a temple. The marks of strangulation did not interest him much. They might have been made before, and Mathilda could have concealed them easily by a collret, a scarf, or any similar piece of cloth. And what about her head wound? The blow on the temple? And the handprint on the wall? What about that? And the screams? She yelled! As there is no attack in the Yellow Room, there must be Nightmare in the Yellow Room. In her dream, she sees the mother about to spring upon her and she cries, Help! Murder! <gasps> Help! Help! Murder! Her hand wildly seeks the revolver she had placed within her reach on the night table, by the side of her bed. But her hand, striking the table, ah! overturns it, and the revolver, falling to the floor, discharges itself, the bullet ah! lodging in the ceiling. After wakening from her rightful dream, and crying aloud for her father, she faints, and falls heavily, and hits the corner of the night table. That is when you break down the door of the yellow room. Well, I'm sort of disappointed by all this. So, so the murderer was not there. But then... When was he? Long, long before.
to the car. You know the truth. Why didn't Matilda tell me? Even if you persist in saying silent, I am as judge of the National Court, forced to free Robert Arzac of all charges. You are hereby declared innocent. You are free. What is this secret motive that compels Mathilda to innocent and you to hide her knowledge from her father? Why? I admire your silence and loyalty, Robert. To explain this mystery completely, I need total trust. I can't. I promised. You solved this mystery, and you've unmasked Larson. But Matilda Strangerson's secret will stay protected forever. All this didn't tell me what you were up to this afternoon. What do you need Larson for exactly? You already knew he was guilty. Ah. In other words, you want to know what mystery forced Matilda Strangerson and Robert Dawes like to stay silent? Oh, well. Yeah, kind of. I guess, in other words. Very simple. Very brief. It dates from a distant time, back when Mathilda was living with her father in America. <laughs> Philadelphia, to be exact. At her reception, she met a fellow countryman, a Frenchman, who charmed her with his manners, his kindness, and his love. He was said to be rich. He asked the professor for her hand, but he refused. He didn't want his daughter to marry some conjurer. He banned him from his house. But the young Mathilda, who was discovering love, and we saw no man finer than Herr Jean Balmeyer, was outraged. In the face of her fury, her father, to calm her down, sent her the rest in the banks of the Ohio, with an old out. But Balmeyer joined Mathilda there. They lived happily together. We fought the old aunt and fled. And one day, they came knocking. The police were looking for Balmeyer. They told Matilda who I really was. I had to leave. So I cleared off. After a failed suicide attempt, Matilda Svinnerson went back to her aunt, who accepted to keep her mouth shut. She went back to her father to forget her husband, Balmeyer, but after telling Darzac her story, believing the rumors of Balmier's death, just as she was about to marry him, Balmier suddenly reappeared. She had a letter from him at the reception. He will not allow this wedding because he still loves her, and he reminds her of their love in the Presbytery. The Presbytery has lost nothing of its charm, nor the garden of its brightness. There's nothing left to me. Always hiding, always acting, always cheating, always lying. And all that because of that one terrible mistake. Love. Darzac swore to silence the Palmier if it meant committing a crime. But Larsan learned him to secret appointments. <laughs> That idiot thought he'd learned the truth, but ended up being accused by me. You are a good man, Frederic Larson. No. No, no. I made a mess of my life. Larson demanded that Mathilde fled with him or die. What about that? Quite an investigation. I kept seeking. Go to America, Sinclair. I need to find out one more thing, and the answer lies there. I know it. In Philadelphia. And what is it? Do you really know the whole mystery of Mathilda Strangerson? I don't know. Mathilda Strangerson and Balmier had a child. A boy. Apparently, it was born at the old aunts. Neither the professor nor Larson ever knew he existed. How did you end up with the cane? Larson himself gave it to me. That's all what's left of the famous Balneyeh.